Good morning. How's everyone doing? Doing good? Good. Hey, I just wanted to say, as I was kind of really felt from the Lord there, that uh, how many know, you know, this day people say Cupid shoots little arrows of love. How many know there's another one out there that's not so cute who shoots arrows, and that's called the devil? And uh, I want to ask you real quick, how many of you have been kind of attacked with some discouragement this last couple weeks? There you go. It's a good number of you. Well, I really feel, I, I did a message on Wednesday that uh, isn't online yet, Kevin. Ke- tell Kevin to hurry up. Hurry up, Kevin. No, but uh, it's called How to Remove the Arrows. And uh, I saw something that uh, I heard a pastor talk that I'd never seen before, but the Bible talks in, a, in Ephesians 6.17, it says that, that the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and I always saw that weapon as kind of just to go after the enemy, right? The sword, to go after the enemy. But I also saw that the word sword there is the word makara, which is a little sword. It can be also uh, like, it was like a little Roman sword about a, a, a foot and a half to two feet, but it wasn't real big. And it was a little sword you had with a shield. And so that sword sometimes we also use to take out arrows that have been shot through the armor. How many know we get arrows sometimes shot at us? God doesn't love you. If God would love you, why did he allow this? Or how did this happen, right? You know what I'm saying? Where you start to doubt the love of God. I never forget God said to me once, he said, Craig, I long for the day when Satan cannot turn you into my enemy. How many know sometimes we get mad at God? Now we know better than to say that, but we get hurt and we, the way we show it is we just kind of pull away from ever Anyone ever done that? Kind of pull away from God? But God wants you to know that that word, his word is that makara, to dig out, the, not just to be defensive, but is also to dig out those lies and replace them with the word, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, which is what? The rhema word, which means a specific word for a specific person at a specific time. It's not the logos, just the written word. It's a rhema word. It's a life-giving word. Have you ever read the Bible and all of a sudden the scripture just jumps out at you? That's a rhema word. God wants to fill those hurts in your life, those disappointments, those lies of the devil with his truth. Amen? Because it's the tr- Can you say amen? Wake up. Yeah, there you go. But it's his truth that sets us free. Amen? And the devil only has power in your life primarily he only has power in your life when you believe his lie amen if eve would have said when he says hey did god really said if she would have said yes it is written thou shall not live or you know it is written i it is said don't eat from this tree no i can't eat from it how many know that would have ended it but the fact that she believed the lie gave the devil power in her life so you see how it's important not just to know the truth but to believe the truth and to go after those lies of the devil with truth and say to the devil, it is written. Remember what Jesus did? It is written. When the devil said, why don't you do this? He said, no. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That will be up, I believe, at the, uh, Kevin's going to have it up probably tomorrow. But if you want to listen to that, I think, uh, not just because I did it, but I think it's a really good message. Does anyone who's here like that message? Yep, three people. See, it's powerful. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, I want to encourage you to get that. If you have your listen to it online, if you, and it'll be under like uh, special messages, I think. If your Bibles turn with me to Daniel chapter 2, verse 29. Does anyone want to hear a joke today? Yeah. I'm trying to be Mr. Joke Tell. I got to beat Kevin. And I just heard this joke and I don't have it written down, so I don't know if I can say it right. But there's these kids, they're at a Catholic school and it was in the lunch cafeteria. And the kids came in for lunch and at the end of the table, there's this big bowl of apples. And the sign said, the nun put a sign on it that said, only take one apple, God is watching. But then on the other side of the table, at the other end, there was a, bowl, a big thing of cookies, and a kid wrote on there, take as many as you want, God's watching the apples. <laughs> there you go, that was all right. Let's pray. The title, the title of today's message, for those of you who are note takers, is Jesus Rocks. And hopefully that'll make sense. It's not just he's a rocker, but he really does rock, as we'll see today in our study of Daniel. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your love. Thank you that, Father, even if we've lost loved ones, even if we've lost our spouse, that, Lord, you are our valentine. 
You have loved us with an everlasting love, and you are the one who sticks closer than a brother. You are faithful and true. Even when we are faithless, you are faithful because you cannot deny yourself. So, Lord, I ask today that you would open our, as Paul prayed in Ephesians, open our eyes and open our ears to see how deep, how wide, how long the love of God is for those, for us. And I pray that that love, as your word said, would cast out all fear. Because fear has to do with judgment. It has to do with condemnation. But Lord, when we know we're loved by you, we are secure. Because if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen? And so Lord, we thank you that you're for us. We thank you that you love us. Not because we're worthy. Not because we're perfect. But because you are love. And you are perfect. And so Lord, I pray if anyone here is feeling like they don't feel valued or they don't feel cared about, that they would realize that because you love them gives them great value. So Lord, overwhelm us today with your loving kindness. Overwhelm and bind up the brokenhearted, Father. And I pray today as we teach your word, today it's pretty intense part of Daniel, I ask that you would speak and you would help us to put our thinking caps on and hear what your spirit is saying to us, the church. We give you this time, and we pray for your anointing on the hearers that are here in the lobby or are going to listen online, and I pray for me that you would speak, that I wouldn't say anything that would misrepresent you or not be of you. Let me be someone who represents the true love of God. Thank you, Father. We ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus, and everyone said aloud, amen. All right. Verse 29 of Daniel Chapter 2. And I want to say this real quick. This is pretty intense prophecy. This is probably, as I said, the, one of the most intense prophecies of the Bible. So you want to have your thinking caps on because it's going to be a lot of history. I, 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 was anyone good at history? I wasn't good at history. But I mean, this was a history 101 for me. And so I haven't taught Daniel in a long time. So this kind of woke me up. I hadn't taught it for like, I don't know how long, long time. So uh, I had to kind of learn a whole lot of things again. And so hear this. So listen carefully. Verse 29. Oh, let me give you a background. Daniel uh, King Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon, he has this dream, and it's a pretty intense dream, and it freaks him out, and this is the Craig version, freaks him out, so he tells his wise men, and these wise men were like astrologers, magicians, kind of you know, soothsayers, they were kind of spiritists, they were demonic. And he goes to them and he says, hey, I had this terrible dream, he says, tell me the interpretation. But here's the thing he said, I'm not going to tell you the dream, I want you to tell me the dream, and then... If you can tell me the dream, then I know your interpretation will be, all, will be true also. Well, they said, his soothsayers or all his wise men said, we can't do that. No man can tell you a dream that you had. We, we can't do it. And then he gets angry, and he says to his, his right-hand man, kill all the wise men. And that was including Daniel, even though Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were godly. But he says, kill them all. He got that angry. And so Daniel goes, whoa, whoa, hey, ho, time out. There is a God in heaven that knows secrets. Give me a day, and I will find out. I will inquire of the Lord, and I will find out what your dream is, and I will tell you the interpretation. And what's really cool, as I said last week, God, or God allowed, gave him favor to where King Nebuchadnezzar said, okay, where he wouldn't give the, his guys time, but he gave Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel time to seek the Lord. So here, today, we're going to look at the Dream. He's going to describe the dream to him, and he's going to tell what it means, the interpretation. So put your thinking caps on in Jesus' name. Verse 29. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. Verse 30. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have wisdom more, uh, more wisdom than anyone living. He's saying, do you hear? He's saying, I'm not that special. But for our sakes, whom make known the interpretation to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. The dream had to do with the future of Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. Or I like to say Nebi to shorten it. Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom and that outcome of his great empire. Here Nebuchadnezzar was troubled because the future of his empire, which had suddenly found himself, he was the here he was nothing, and now he's the possessor 
of one of the most powerful empires in the known world. And he's the head of it. He's the dictator. What he says goes. The dream was God's answer to his problem. Daniel makes it clear that he himself deserves no credit that God and God alone had in, from heaven revealed the dream to him. And that it was God who prompted to reveal the dream to spare the lives of the wise men and to spare the lives of Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego. And as well as satisfy the curiosity of King Nebi. God here is going to speak to King Nebuchadnezzar in a language he will understand. How many like that, that God speaks in our language? You know, when I was a hippie and I just got saved and I was like, dude, whatever. You know, the Lord would go, hey, how you doing? I love you, man. You know, he wasn't like, hi, how you doing? I love you. He talked my language, you know. He kind of went, hey, what's up, man? I love you. You know, how many know God speaks in our language? God meets us where we are, and he's speaking a language that he will understand, King Nebi. The language of an outward splendor, because his kingdom was so glorious and so splendor. The glory of his kingdom. And this dream was a dream of the Gentile. Because he was a Gentile, because he's a pagan king, it, God spoke to him using an image and language that he would understand. An image in Nebi's dream was not an image to be worshipped, but it was an image of this great idol in the city of Babylon. It was this big, huge idol. And God used this image in his dream in this land of idolatry such as a vision, was only the language that Nebi could understand. we got to remember that in Babylon, if you remember, the first known false religion was from Babylon. Does anyone know what that religion was? The first known uh, false religion mentioned in the Bible. What was it? The Tower of Babel, which came from Babylon. So this is a city of great false religion, of, of many idols and many falsehoods, and here it is. So he's speaking to him about idol. He's showing them this great idol. This image of his dream is the land of idolatry. It's just huge all over the place. And Babylon, as I said, was the fountainhead for idolatry and pagan religions. We see in this section that the history of the rule of this world by the Gentiles. Hear this. Before this, the rule was pretty much of David's throne. Remember what he said to, 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 to David? He said, your throne will last forever. But how many know David's throne is not right now, is it? But it will come when Jesus comes and rules and reigns. But right now, we're seeing the splendor of David and Solomon's kingdom now is being handed over to the Gentiles because of the failure of David's house, because of the failure of Solomon and Rehoboam. God is now taking the scepter of the universe out from the hands of of the line of David, and he's putting it in the hands of the Gentiles. I don't know about you. Uh, you know, it's a big argument. You know, people believe in dominion theology, and that's basically, some people take this text today and say, see, God wants us to take over the world. How many know we're not going to take over the world? We're to pray his kingdom come and his will be done. We're to pray that he would minister through us and that there would be a touch of kingdom in our families and in our houses and in this land. But how many know we're not going to usher in the kingdom of God? And if we are to do that, then how many know we're doing a pretty bad job? Whoa, what was that? Okay, um, but uh, we're, doing, we're not doing a great job. If you watch Fox News, how many know get depressed when you watch the news? And if we're going to usher it in, how many know that it's saying, no, we're not going to usher it in. It's not going to be ushered in until Jesus comes back and rules and reigns in the thousand-year reign. Now, some people say, well, dominion, if we'll make it ready for Jesus. How many know when Jesus comes back, as we'll see today, he's going to destroy all the kingdoms so he can set up his thousand-year reign. But Luke 21, 24 calls this time from Nebuchadnezzar, from when they took captive of, of, of Israel to write to, to, till the Lord comes back is called the time of the Gentiles. That's the time we're in right now. And there until Jesus comes again to this earth, Christ will take then the scepter and the rule of this earth and the king, he will be the king of kings and lord of lords and he will rule this world with an iron rod. How many are excited about that? 
That he, he came as a suffering servant, but now he's going to come back as conquering king. I love that when John the Beloved, who used to lay his little head on Jesus' lap, I know for guys that's a little weird, isn't it? I mean, it's just, you know, I understand putting your head maybe on his shoulder, give him a hug, but to lay your head in his lap, wow, he was really confident of his manhood. But, uh, and he did that. But guess what? When he saw Jesus in Revelation 1, the same Jesus he'd snuggled with, what happened? It said he fell like a dead man. Because Jesus is now glorified. And how many know that, you know, I always love that song, will we stand in his presence or at his, and his feet will we fall? How many know the answer is to that, the latter? We're going to fall and he's going to pick us up in love, but we're not going to go, hey, what's up, brother? No, 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 no. We're going to fall and he's going to say, hey, I love you and pick you up. And so that's how powerful he's going to be in his second coming. The time of the Gentiles is from the day of Nebuchadnezzar right down through our day until the Lord comes back in the thousand-year reign or the millennial kingdom, which means a thousand years. I am longing for that kingdom to come. I'm longing to come and ride on those white horses with Jesus. And, you know, whoosh, my wife just got me for, for a, a Valentine's Day. She got me a bonanza. Remember bonanza? And they'd tear through the thing. It'd be burning. I want to come like Jesus, with, with Jesus like that. Amen. You know, saddle up your horses. Let's get going. All right. You wake up, smile on that. Those of you who love horses, girls, oh, horses, precious. No, can't even just kid. Verse 31. You, O king, were watching. And behold, a great image, this great image whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. Verse 32, this image head, head, image head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Now, I don't know about you, when I used to hear this in Bible college, I'm like, what? This is so intense. I can barely memorize all these things. But, but hear me, it, it's, it, this is talking of world history. It's important that we learn this because it will help explain to you how we're not going to take over the world with Christianity. Here it is. Verse 34, you watch while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Verse 35, the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer's, summer's threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. What a dream Nebuchadnezzar had. He saw this image, this image of this awesome huge man and the head of gold and chest of arms, or chest of arms, <laughs> chest and arms of silver, a bronze belly, iron legs, feet and toes mixed with iron and clay. And looking at this huge image, Nebi saw a stone that just cut with, not cut with hands, rolled down and just blast through and shatter it all. How I many know that's an awesome stone? Hopefully you're kind of, by the title, you're kind of figuring out who that stone is is amen and so this stone just cuts through it just crashes knocks down the whole stature like a bowling pin and suddenly the stone became a great mountain and filled the entire earth and i don't know about you but no wonder nebi is getting a little freaked out he's going my kingdom that i've worked so hard to build is going to be shattered it's just going to be crushed it's going to be broken and he's kind of how you know you build work hard to build something, you don't want to just say, I don't want to see a vision of this church just getting shattered and crushed and ran over or blown up by a meteor, right? That would be shocking, and that's what he just saw in his dream. Notice the head, the arms, the chest, the belly, and the legs are going down in value. Now let me say this. Those of you who don't know this, these are all kingdoms. These are all empires, and hear this, even though we're going to see the value goes down with each one, right? Gold is more expensive than silver. Silver is more expensive than bronze. Bronze is more expensive than iron. But guess what? It doesn't mean that these kingdoms are less powerful. Because we're going to see the last kingdom was one of the most powerful kingdoms. But it's saying the power of the leaders is decreasing with each one as it goes down in succession. The power of these leaders are, are, are decreasing 
How many know that America, our leadership is trying to go back to like a monarchy, to power, where one or two men rule the world or do things? But how many know we had a democracy because we want many checks and balances, amen? But how many know, and I'm not saying it's just a Democrat thing, it's a Republican thing, we do it. We kind of, there's in us that we want to be the head honcho. But we're going to see that these go down in value, that they don't, get, they don't keep growing. That is, the gold is greater value than silver, which is of greater value than bronze, which is greater value than iron. These four metals in a single image speak of world history in its entirety. As it relates to Israel from the time of Nebuchadnezzar until the coming, second coming of Christ. Notice, too, how all the kingdoms are getting, as I said, weaker in the sense of the leader's power. Now, let me tell you this. All these kingdoms that we're going to see, the first kingdom, I'm not going to tell you yet, the first kingdom is, has a 70-year reign. The second kingdom has a 200-year reign. The third kingdom has a 200-year reign. The fourth kingdom has a 500-year reign and was crushing. So it has nothing to do with the size or the outreach of these, these armies or empires. It has to do with the power of the leaders of each one of these empires that they're getting weakened. Verse 36. This is is the dream. I like this. Remember the soothsayers and the, 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 the spiritists said, hey, no man, no man can tell you this dream. And here Daniel goes, yes, I can. God in me can do this. There's a God who knows secrets. This is the dream. Now we will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. Verse 37, you, O king, are the king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you kingdom a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Do you hear that? God sets up governments. Now, I love that. If you're not happy with the way our government's going, guess what? One person said, in a democracy, you get the kind of government you deserve. I want to tell you this. Hear this, guys. I need to say this. This is free. There's supposed to be 80 million evangelicals in the United States. But hear this, and if 80 million evangelicals voted biblical values for the candidate that best represented Christ and his values, we would dominate the elections. But hear what's sad. This is what's so sad. And even people in this church have told me this. What's so sad is the best turnout ever. What does anyone think what the best turnout is or who doesn't know? What's the best turnout in elections have ever come out? Out of the 80 million, what's the best turnout? Someone want to throw a number out? All right, not everyone at once. Okay, I'll tell you. What is it? Five million? No, a little higher than that. 30 million. That means five, 50 million evangelicals are sitting home. I've talked to people in this church that say, Craig, I don't want to vote because the election's rigged and it doesn't matter and whatever I vote, it's still going to go whatever the way people want. Hear this. That might be true. I can't say for sure it isn't, but hear this. I love what John Quincy Adams said, our fourth president or sixth, I don't know which one, but right in the beginning, he was a Christian and he said, it's our duty, God has called us to do our duty, but the results are up to God. How many know, none of us want to be called a wicked, lazy servant because we didn't vote, amen? We want to vote and trust the results to God, but we want to say, I did my part. I did my part to vote. I did my part to pray that the best leader of America would take his place or her place. Amen? Amen. So we need to do that. So God gives, gives, uh, raises up rulers, even, even pagan rulers. 38, and wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. The Babylonian Empire was an absolute monarchy. That meant that whatever Nebi said went. He didn't have to go get approval from council or, or get senate. He just said, I want all the wise men dead. And that's what it was. That's how fast it was. And, and even remember Daniel last week said, well, what's going on? Why is he being so hasty? What's up? He could just say something and that's it. He could say, remember, he would tear you from limb from limb. And he'd make your house a pile of rubble and kill your whole family. How many know you would fear that kind of king? Babylon had a great effect on the known world than any other empire 
in world history. That's why it's represented by gold. They also say this, that Nebi, because he was so powerful, he had gold everywhere. He had gold throne. He had a gold scepter. He had gold floors. He had gold walls. He had gold plates, goblets, everything. Uh, a historian said he went there ni- 90 years after his death. And it still was, he said, I've never seen so much gold in all my life. It's overwhelming. This is 90 years after Nebi had been there. Can you imagine what it was like when he was there? So that's why it's represented by gold. It's like God can see everything, amen? And he saw this, and that's why he's represented as the gold. Verse 39, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. Now think about that, my, the point I'm trying to make. It's inferior, but yet it defeated Babylon, so do you see, it, does, it has power, but it's inferior because the rulers or the leaders will not have the power that Nebi had. The Medes and the Persians, they were two empires coming together. That's why you have the two, the chest of silver and the two arms. So you have two branches, two different, uh, what do you call, powers or different empires coming together, the Medes and the Persian, the Medo-Persian Empire, that would overthrow the Babylonians in 530 BC. The Medes and the Persians here are represented by the two arms of silver and the chest of silver. They were, hear this, and the reason why they are silver is because they taxed people heavily. They taxed their people heavily and they made them pay them with silver. So they just had silver everywhere. They loved silver. And so that's why scholars say that they were the chest and arms of silver. They were, to show how they're getting weaker, they were a constitutional monarchy. Does anyone know what a constitutional monarchy, any history buffs out there? I went, okay, I need to go back to school. I had no idea what a constitutional monarchy was, but here it is, the lesson of power. You have an absolute dictator, now you have a constitutional monarchy. So here it is. Sometimes, I don't know about you, I read things and I just go, that's good, whatever. Constitutional monarchy, that's bad. It's lesser. But here it is. It's a form of government in which the king or queen acts as the head of state But the ability to make or pass legislation legislation resides with an elected parliament, not with the monarch. And so you get it? So that means they're like the queen. The Medes and Persians were like, hello. You know, they just wave, they knight you, they go and bless your party, and that's about all they do. Amen? I don't know why English people, I'm sorry if you're English, they just love their queen, but I'm like, what does she do except take a lot of your money? Amen? Amen? But they love her, so God bless them. You know, but that's what it is. So it's less power. They had to go to legislation. They had to go to parliament and say, hey, is it all right if I kill all the wise men? Middle of verse 39. Then another, a third kingdom of bronze or brass, some versions say, which shall rule over all the earth. The Medes and the Persians would be overthrown by the Greeks or the Grecians. In 330 B.C., Alexander the Great. How many have heard of Alexander the Great? So now we're hearing someone we know. He conquered the known world. And why they were the brass or bronze is because they were just bronze back then. was powerful metal. So they had brass breastplate. They had brass shield, brass helmet, brass sword, brass everything. So they were known as the bronze or brass people. And that's why they are called the bronze Alexander had conquered the known world, but he became heartbroken and depressed that there were no more worlds to conquer. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? You think there's some power-hungry people on wall. You think Donald Trump likes to win. Can you imagine conquering the whole world? I just get overwhelmed trying to conquer Northwest Tucson for Jesus, amen? Can you imagine the whole world, the whole known world? And he ran out of things to conquer, and he was depressed, And sadly, this man, at age 33, drunk himself to death in a drunken stupor. Isn't that amazing? Like the Bible says, without hope, the people, or without a vision, the people perish. If you don't have a reason to live, you'll perish. Now contrast the life of Alexander the Great with another one who died at age 33. This one conquered also, but what did he conquer? He conquered sin and death, amen? Amen. He conquered sin and death that you and I might live. How many love that conquer a lot better, amen? I love Jesus because of that. I love that he has come, that we might have life and life more abundantly. 
The Grecian Empire was represented by bronze because, hear this, you're going to love this. How many know this one? An oligarchy. Has anyone heard of an oligarchy? Right? Does anyone know what an oligarchy is? Mark, you do? Oh, look at it. One person knows. All right, smart. But uh, oligarchy, I could, you know, I just thought molarchy. I didn't know what kind of garchy it is. But oligarchy, this is even a less powerful government that the Medo Persian Empire had than the Medo Persian. The oligarchy definition is a form of government run by a small number of people or a council, such as wealthy landowners, royalty, or powerful military figures. So, these people, the, 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 the Grecians, had to go to a council. So Alexander had the great, before he could just conquer the known world, had to say, hey, council, is it all right if we do this? Guys, you know, landowners, you know, princes, is it all right if we do this? He so had less authority. Verse 40, And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, and as much as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break into pieces and crush all others. The Greeks, as you know, would be unseated or beaten by the Roman Empire. Although they crushed everyone into a bloody submission, the Romans represented the, are represented by the iron. And that iron talks about an iron rod of power. But hear this. They had what is called a limited democracy. And I like this. It's amazing how when you study history, you really do see what we learn from history is that we what? Learn nothing from history. But listen to this. Does anyone know what destroyed Rome? Rome destroyed Rome, right? Rome imploded. Probably what's pretty close to one of the most powerful governments in the known land? What's it called? America. What are we? Democracy. I love what this commentator said. He said in a democracy, a lot of time, given enough time, will eventually destroy itself. What? It says he'll destroy itself because the people will realize they can vote to empty the coffers to pay for all the things they want. Sound like any country you know? Free education, free health care, free homes, free cell phones, free this, free, free. And I mean, it's all neat. Until we have to pay for it. Amen? And that's what destroys. He's saying it's a limited democracy. And he says democracy a lot of times will not work because people's selfishness. Isn't it amazing how no matter what government you have, we can, we can mess it up as humans? Which made them even less powerful than all the other three. The Grecians, oligarchy, the four empires in succession. This now stops... Because in AD 70, the Romans annihilated Israel. They burned the temple. They destroyed it. They drove the Jews out. The Jews scattered, and Israel was never again a sovereign nation until when? 1948. May of 1948. I don't know about you, but isn't that cool? No other people group, if you're not sure, people have what's called reform theology or replacement theology that says Israel, God is done with Israel. And hear this, the reason why that made sense is because when Israel was not in the land before 1948, how, how, how many know it was hard to believe that after 1,700 years they would get back in the land? Amen? So theologians, we try to help God out. They said, hey, we need to replace Israel with the church. But how many know that the church is not Israel and Israel is not the church? How many know that God talks about in Romans 11 about restoring Israel and grafting them back in, true Israel? Amen? And so we as Christians need to love Israel. And Israel was brought back after almost 1,900 years, 1,880 years, he brought them back into the land. Miracle. Never had happened ever with any people group. And suddenly because of that, the prophetic clock is miraculously starting to tick again when Israel reemerged as an independent nation. Years later. And now we see the appearance of this last world power. Verse 41, whereas you saw the feet and toes, how many toes are there? Ten, right? Ten toes, Potter, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron. The kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it. 
just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, or kind of the clay where you make a mold, you know, if you ever poured metal, you make this kind of, you have this kind of like black clay, ceramic clay. Verse 42, and the toes, ten toes, of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay. And you need to know that, that that doesn't mix, right? That doesn't make a strong thing because they don't bond together. Clay and iron don't mix. So the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. So everything's getting weaker. Verse 43, and you saw iron mixed with ceramic, as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. In the feet, the composition is changed. These ten toes, which are part of iron and part of clay, don't hold together. And hear this, since the fall of the Roman Empire, there has never been a world-dominating power equal to Rome. Amen? If you ever saw a gladiator, you see. Remember, they would go, whoa, I didn't man- believe man could build things like this. I mean, it was just unbelievable what they did. But there was no equal. Many have tried, the Huns, Islam, the so-called Holy Roman Empire, Napoleon, Hitler, Stalin, but none have succeeded. Each of these had amazing power and influence, but nothing compared to the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire is some, in some form or another, hear this, now this is where I want you to listen, especially, is the Roman Empire in some form or another will be a revived under the leadership of the final dictator, which will be what? The Antichrist. There's going to be, hear this, a revived Roman Empire out of ten different empires or ten kings that are going to be kind of a federation or coalition that they're going to come together out of Europe and they're going to come against the Lord. And Jesus is going to come back, and you can read this in Daniel 7.24, not right now, but later if you want to check it, and Revelation 17.12. But it's going to say that these kings will rise up, the Antichrist will work through them, and then they will be crushed by the rock. But hear this. I want to be careful, because sometimes we get so excited to see God in history, that we say things that make us look kind of foolish, right? We, you know, people have said, oh, Jesus is coming back this year, even though the Bible says we don't know the date of the hour, we don't, we, but we know the seasons, but we don't know, we shouldn't admit, name dates, but yet sometimes pastors do, and how we know they look foolish? But we can see the signs, right? We can see the seasons, and we believe he's definitely coming back sooner than ever. I mean, we know Israel's back in the land, that's pretty amazing. But hear this, I was listening to Pastor Chuck and I was listening to John Corson, I think in about 1986, maybe 88, but they were saying they were excited about the Treaty of Rome. And that was back in 1951, and they were excited, like, oh, the Treaty of Rome. There's this treaty of this coalition getting together with all these nations. And then it became from the Treaty of Rome, it went to the European Common Market. And then now today, it's called the European Union. But then, back in 1988, there was 10 of them. Ten, i got to get my numbers right. Ten. And so they're all like, yeah, this is it, this is it, ten. Well, how many know there's now 28? Now, hear me. I don't know what's going to happen. Are the other 18 going to just fall off the, fall out of it? Are they going to be destroyed? Are they going to just quit or what? I don't know. I mean, sometimes you can say that, right? I don't know. I, I wish I did. I was, wish I was a lot smarter. I, I wish if John Corson were here, he'd be able to tell you how it's revised now. But I, all I could find out is that what this is, is that this prophecy doesn't mention the other 18 empires. So some scholars say that they don't have, the, the reason why they don't mention them is because they don't have any rule or effect over Israel. But these 10 will. Now, I kind of like to say this. I don't know how it's going to get down to 10, but I know it's going to get down to 10. Amen? Just like we didn't know how Israel's going to get back in the land after 1,800 years, but Israel got back in the land. So guess what? In the last days, right before Jesus comes back, there is going to be a federation of a Roman, a revived Roman empire of 10 separate kings and 10 separate empires, but yet kind of together, and they are going to war against the Lamb. 
and God's going to shut them down. God's going to say it's time to bowl. Amen? Verse 44. In the days of these kings, ten of them, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, his kingdom. And the kingdom shall not be left to, left to other people. It shall break into pieces and consume all these kingdoms, all the four and then this last one. And it shall stand forever. Verse 44. And as much as you saw the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. Notice, it doesn't win these kingdoms. It crushes these kingdoms. You get it? So to believe we're going to take over the world isn't true, because you say, why would he have to crush them if he, you know what I mean? You don't crush something if you're going to overtake it, right? If you want to take someone's land, you don't crush Babylon. You just take it over. You occupy it. But they're going to crush it. Jesus is going to crush it. The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. And I love this. Listen to this. This dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. Don't you love that? He doesn't go, was I right? I'm good, right? Is it cool? My head's good? He just says, hey, king, you know this is certain and this interpretation is sure. Wouldn't you love to like walk like that? Or you just give a word to someone, I know this is the Lord. And people, you know, wow. And that's the way Daniel was. In the time of the ten nations, this coalition to revive Roman Empire, a stone not cut with hands will come down and strike the feet, and the entire image is going to be pulverized, going to fall. The stone is the rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ. Do you see my title? Jesus rocks. Amen? I love that. Sometimes we think of Jesus as just this little mellow hippie. Hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? With long hair, just kind of sandals, walking around, his Birkenstocks. no. He's going to come back powerfully, amen, and every knee shall bow. He's going to come back, and he's going to pulverize all these kingdoms that have set themselves up against him. Peter says that to the Jews, Jesus is a stone of stumbling, and that's found in 1 Peter 2.8. Indeed, to this day, the Jewish people, sadly, for the most part, still stumble over Jesus. Now hear this. There's Jews getting saved, Joel Rosenberg. But primarily, he, it says in Romans where he says he's going to draw the Jew, but he says what? Right now he's blinded their eyes from the truth. They're blinded. You share with them, they're like, eh, no. You talk to Jewish people, and they say they love born-again Christians. They love strong evangelicals because we support Israel. But they said, we just we agree with everything of you except your Messiah. And I talked to the guy who was the head of Sanhedrin. Isn't that cool? The Sanhedrin is revived. I forget him back in like 2010. The head guy, I forget, something Cohen or something. But he's, whatever his name was, he's the head of the Temple Institute trying to get all the things ready for the temple. And I got to talk to him. He's now the head of the Sanhedrin. Isn't that cool? 70 elders. He's one of the heads of it. But I got to talk to him. He says, Craig, we thank you for your support. We thank you for your prayers. We thank you for all that you do for Israel. But we just don't agree with your Messiah. And I said, that's cool. And just because you don't agree for, in him, he agrees with you and he loves you. And he's drawing you to, your, to himself. And he said, amen, just, just pray if he's the Messiah that I would see it. And so it's really cool. But he just, you could kind of tell, he's like, I know he's not. The Jews, he is a stone of stumbling. But hear this. Sometimes we go, yeah, those Jews, man, those Jews, they're just blind. Why won't they, you know, Martin Luther went even far to say that they were Christ killers. But hear this, anyone who chooses not to believe in Jesus, that stone will crush anyone who rejects Jesus. Amen? And we need to know that. You know, I'm trying to be the softer side of Sears. I'm trying to be the loving Craigie. But how many know God is love, but he is also just? And we need to know that. He is not to be trifled with. He is not to be treated as, ah, you know, I'll talk my way out of it when I get to heaven. No. Matthew 21, 42, Jesus said this. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone, talking about himself, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? So this stone you're rejecting is me. I'm your Messiah. This was the Lord's doing, and it was marvelous in our eyes. Verse 43, 
Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Verse 44, and hear this. This is the key. Is it a little toasty in here? I am toasty. Must be getting hot flashes or something. I'm just so much love, you know. But anyways, here it is. Verse 44. And whoever falls on the stone will be broken. But on whoever it falls, it will grind them to powder. This is concerning Jesus, the rock of our salvation, the Savior of the world. And hear this, guys. This is what I want you to get out of this whole message because I know there's a lot of history. But hear this. We can either bow, we can either bro- be broken before him today or we can be broken by him later. How many would rather be broken before him today? How many would rather surrender to his love today? But that's why the Bible says today is a day of salvation because guess what? If you die without Christ... How many know you will be broken or crushed by this same stone? If you're a Bible, I want you to see this. You can turn with me to John 3.18. I want you to see this because I think this is really powerful. You know, a lot of times we are so worried about our sins and we're so worried about that we're going to go to hell because we have struggled with this sin over the years or we're we're worried that we didn't get this sin right or we didn't confess this sin. But hear this. I want you to hear today once and for all that the reason that people go to hell, the reason that people are crushed by Jesus is not because Jesus doesn't love them, but it's because they've rejected Jesus, the cornerstone. Hear this. For God loved the world, or I'm sorry, that's John 3.16. You ever heard of that one? Here it is. John 3.18. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. And what does it say in Romans? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So there's no judgment against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged. Why? For their sin? No. For not believing in God's one and only son. Do you get it? We don't go to hell because of our sin. We don't go to hell because we haven't, God can't forgive our sin. We go to hell because we rejected the God's loving provision for sin. Do you see that? Isn't that make it a lot better? It's not about us being good enough or perfect enough. It's about are you in Christ? Have you bowed your knee to this rock? Or have you resisted this rock and resisted giving your life to Christ? And because of that, when you stand before him, you will be what? Broken without him. Because God's going to look at you and not say, you did this, you did that. He's going to say, what did you do with my son? Amen? Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you this. If you're here today and maybe you've never really surrendered your life to Christ, you've never really given, you've never really bowed your heart before God. And I want to say this to you, as it says, if, if you, it says he who falls from the rock before the rock will be broken. If you give your life to Christ today, there's going to be times where he breaks you. There's going to be times when he takes you places you don't want to go. He's going to make you deal with things you don't want to deal with. But guess what? The other alternative is if you don't surrender to him today, it says he who the rock falls upon will be crushed. And I think that we would rather have the first one, right? We don't want to be crushed by God. We don't want to stand before God and hear him say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because you rejected my son, the cornerstone. So if you're here today and you feel in your heart, you're sensing the Holy Spirit drawing you, And just right now, if you're strong in the Lord, just pray that God would draw people right now. Those who need to give their life to Christ, those who need to recommit. If you're here today and you've never really bowed your knee, oh, you might have prayed a prayer, but you know deep in your heart right now, you have not really bowed your heart before the stone, before Jesus, the rock. And today God is asking you to bow your knee before him so that he can forgive your sins, so that he can cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But then I also feel that there's another group here today. 
There's those of you who know Jesus, but you maybe haven't been living right. You've been just kind of doing your own thing, going your own way. You've made Jesus Savior, but you haven't really made him Lord. And today Jesus is saying, I want your whole life. I want you to bow and surrender your whole life before me. I want you to give me the reins so I can control and direct your life. I can bless you and I can lead you in ways everlasting. And if that is you today, I want to pray for you. With every head bowed and every eye closed out of respect for the Lord, I just want to ask you right now, if that is you today and you'd say, Craig, I want to pray to receive Christ or I want to pray to recommit my life. If you've mis- meant that, if you pr- want to pray that prayer, you want to pray for you, just raise. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. Just raise your hand right now. God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Right there. And God bless you right there. God bless you in the back. Anyone else? You feel the Lord calling you to just surrender. God bless you right here. I want to pray with you. And I want to ask you right now that everyone would pray out loud. Even if you're doing great with the Lord. How many know you can't pray to receive Jesus too much? But just pray. Some people say, Craig, I don't know how to lead people to Christ. Well, learn. Pray this prayer and you'll learn how to lead someone to Christ. Amen? So pray this with me so no one feels like they're the only one praying. Will everyone pray it out loud? Everyone do it together. Just repeat after me. Lord Jesus... Please forgive me my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I bow before you for the first time or I surrender my life to you again. Thank you for receiving me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and empower me, Lord, to live for you all the days of my life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for receiving me back. Now I humbly ask that you would guide me and direct me and that, Lord, I would live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap. Amen. God is good. Amen. If you prayed to receive Christ, make sure you tell someone, tell me, tell Kevin, tell Morgan or Mariah, tell somebody that you received Christ, tell the person you came with, or if you recommitted, you need to talk, just talk with someone. I want you to know this. We're going to do this every service. I really believe that, you know, we love to teach the word, but I want to tell you how many know Jesus had the teaching of the word with signs and wonders following. And I want to tell you, sometimes we need to just have a human pray for us and help us or encourage us. And I want to say that after service, we're going to have a time of prayer. If you need prayer for anything, don't think it's too weird, anything, except for maybe pray for your chihuahua. I don't do that. But if it's for anything, we will pray for you. If you need healing, you need encouragement, you need prayer for a loved one, we, you know, that maybe a loss, a son or daughter that's gone away, we'll pray for you up here. I encourage you after we sing this last song, if that is, if you stay in here, it's fine, but just talk a little quiet as respect for the ministry going on up front, okay? If you need to talk loud, if you're like me, and you're like, hey, then go to the foyer if you would. That would be awesome. All right? God is good. We love you guys. Let's stand and worship the Lord with all our heart one last time.